setting the context you know, to what we are actually going to do uh, in, in today and the next three days. And, uh, and I insisted that the context was absolutely fundamental because if the perception <coughs> is wrong, then what ends up happening is that you don't pay attention to things the way you're supposed to pay attention to them. Okay? And one of the biggest problems that this discipline has is not necessarily that we actually do not have the technical knowledge or we don't know, is that we don't perceive the need for that technical knowledge. And uh, so being able to set the context many times ends up justifying some of the absurdities that you see that we do on a regular basis. So, so today I'm going to start you know, for about an hour talking about the absurd. Okay? And uh, I'm trying to interject it with physical concepts that actually can become quite complex in nature, and, uh, but nevertheless they have to always be contrasted against the absurd. Okay? Now, let me get straight to the point. So let's talk about egress. Okay? So the first concept okay, is this idea that if we have a fire, we have to get people out. What do you think about that? Why is that necessary? Yeah, but that doesn't make it necessary. The fact that you're afraid doesn't make it necessary. Yeah, but in, instead of moving people, which is always a very complex system, why don't we just put the precautions in place? Because we don't understand how the system works. And why do we don't understand how the system works? You wanted to say something? Uh, I just wanted to say the reason we want to evacuate them is probably because it's the only way we can be 100% sure that they're safe. Like but how can you be 100% sure that they're safe by moving them around a building that is burning? I mean, is, is that assumption? You're making the assumption. Let me kill this internet because it's going to start screaming at me constantly. But again, I mean, think about it. You already made all these assumptions that actually the safest thing to do is to get people out. I mean, potentially, okay? Now, the reality is that a smaller building doesn't necessarily make you safe. There was recently a fire in, 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 in a 19th century old building in, in a hotel, and, uh, and there was uh, two people in the second floor, and uh, effectively the fire was not a big fire, but it was quite unusual because it started in a cupboard, so uh, an employee brought uh, the, he was required to clean up the chimney at the end of the, of the evening. And it was bitterly cold outside, so instead of actually taking the bucket, you know, with all the ashes from the chimney, the, the employee decided he was going to put it in a cupboard. You know, without realizing there was also some combustible materials in the cupboard, so effectively the fire started growing in the cupboard, so by the time they opened the door, this was a V-shaded environment, so they had an enormous amount of products of incomplete combustion. So the result was that this cloud of smoke went into this very small building and in a second, so basically the alarm sounded and these people tried to evacuate, but the smoke was going up the stairs, so they went past the smoke and they died in the process. If they would have stayed in the room, nothing would have happened. I think it's our nature that we want to escape from danger. Yes. The, you see, that's a natural thing to do, not the rational thing to do, okay? So people are afraid, and therefore you want to run away from the things that you are afraid. But needless to say, as you just described it, it is just a nature thing, it's your instinct. It is not a rational thought. Nevertheless, we have converted this problem into a rational thought without necessarily questioning it. And this is what runs us into a number of different problems. So what happens with people that have mobility problems? What do we do with them? 
So you put them in a cupboard, you close the door, and let them wait until the firefighters come to rescue them, no? while everybody else is privileged you know, to be able to walk down the stairs. Okay, but the only reason why that is necessary is because we started by the premise that we needed to get people out. Now, in many cases, we actually can't. So, what examples do you have of places where you actually cannot evacuate people? Hospitals. Hospital is a perfect example, no? So, if you are an intensive care unit, uh, you know, and you're being operated you know, very dangerous operation, nobody can move you. So we know how to defend in place. You know, we were talking about the state put strategy. In that case, for example, we've already made the decision that people are not going out. Okay, nevertheless, this whole process of egress is a process that puts us in a position that we are designing against the absurd. Okay, and, and this is what we have to really keep in mind because when we're dealing with egress, effectively we're dealing with human behavior. And we can pretend that we're doing all the calculations that we want, but the reality is that none of those calculations have any precision. Because at the end of the day, you will never know what people are going to do, okay? And this is a problem. So everything that I'm gonna talk at the beginning as part of the context as I interject other things, you take it with a grain of salt. Because the reality is that those numbers are actually meaningless. They're just indicators that give me a sense of what I should expect if people behave in a reasonable manner. Yes? Yes. I think neither one nor the other because effectively the, the error bar is so big that the average is meaningless, okay? So what you actually do is the opposite. So you induce ideal behavior, and then you assume that ideal behavior is representative, okay? So that's what you're gonna do. So when we look at the way in which we design stairs, the way in which we uh, put alarms, the way in which we put signs, we are trying to induce ideal behavior to make sure that your behavior replicates as close as possible, the calculations. But the calculations are effectively a Lagrangian flow. So it's purely fluid mechanics, where every individual is a sphere, and that individual moves through a pipe. So the calculations don't take into account at all, you know, the human behavior. Now, how do we introduce human behavior? By introducing certain algorithms that modulate the behavior of the particles in a manner that is not consistent with Navier-Stokes, okay? So in principle, you model the flow as Navier-Stokes, but you know there is always going to be an idiot in the room. So you get one of your Lagrangian particles moving in the opposite direction, okay? That's, that's basically what you do. Now, how do you introduce that? With a completely stochastic, random, you know, sort of function that is going to embed that, okay? So we try to modulate it to try to induce this negative behavior to get a sense of the variability. But most of the times we come up to the conclusion that the random behavior can be so random and so extreme that the error bars still remain enormous, okay? So in principle, you know, we always have this perception that we need to get people out. And as we're being driven, you know, by our instincts that effectively being out is safer than being in without recognizing that in the process, many times, we're doing two things that are problematic. The first one is that we are putting people at risk in the process of egress, and the second one is that we are trading off measures of protection. Because under the assumption that I'm getting out, I get away with not putting this and not putting that and not putting the other. Is that okay? So this is where the problem comes up, and we have to be very conscious that we actually are systematically doing that. The moment that we accept that we're getting people out, we are effectively lowering the safety of the building. Because if I'm in a hospital and I'm accepting that people shall remain in the, in the building, then I'm gonna lift the protection of the building in a way such that I can guarantee that people within the building are safe. Is that okay? 
So that's the principle. So let me show you a picture. I like picking up on Brazilians. So this is another building in Brazil. And, uh, and it has one particularity that is quite interesting. So it has one, two, three stairs. Okay. So the question is, how do I get everybody out? This is a tall building, you know, 30 something stories. And the architect has designed two proper stairs and an add-on. And that add-on is a requirement of code. So the code requires that in Brazil, or at least in Sao Paulo, as you start increasing the height of the building, you make the decision that you have to start increasing the number of stairs. That naturally ends up limiting the height of buildings because it gets to a point that you've added so many stairs that all you have is stairs and you don't have a floor plan anymore. Is that okay? So that becomes quite problematic, which basically prevents building from being too high because you cannot circumvent the code. Okay? So when I show you that and I put the question forwards, if the purpose is to get people out, how many stairs do I need? Hmm? Why? Don't talk to me about codes. Let's start thinking. Of course. So if you protect it appropriately, why would you need more than one? Because because of the flow of the people and the, the, the kind of... Well, make it big enough. It's, it's never enough, you know, people keep... No, 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 no. Let's talk rationally, okay? Of course, we can always say there's never enough and we can always put more bells and whistles and this is how we end up with three stairs in a building, okay? The question is, do we actually need three stairs? Let's not get into the details. You have one stair. It can be anywhere in the building. Yeah, but people have to pass through fire if they're gonna, like if, if you have fire in, in, in one of the sides and then you put only stairs in that side and the fire is blocking their way, they can't go through that. Floor. If by the time you get out of that floor, you have a fire that is so big that it doesn't allow you to get past it, you are already in trouble. Okay? Not only you're in trouble because the fire is affecting you, but if, do you know how people behave in the presence of smoke? Badly. So you're mostly in trouble because people are already in panic, and that goes against everything that I said at the beginning. We want them to behave like Lagrangian particles. So we cannot be in that situation. You have to make sure that they're moving very early on and out of there before there's any sign of a major problem. So how many stairs do you need? If there's a fire, one well, of these stairs, I guess you have two. Yes, but you eliminate all the fuel out of the stairs, okay. and that's it. Now, if you have a fire in the stairs, when the stairs is completely compartmentalized, as we talked yesterday, so you stay in your floor. Of course, yes. you have to make sure it works. Yes. Is that okay? So you only need one. I might accept putting two, okay? Just because every safety system should have a redundancy, okay? And, uh, you don't seem to be happy with what I just said. I'm just following it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Yes. Of course, I will have to design the system in a way that it works. Yeah, so the second step would be, would be uh, just, just by the block as a way to access higher floors without having to step the moving up. Of course, you don't want the firefighters to conflict. I mean, this, for example, happened in the World Trade Center Towers, that the firefighters went into conflict with the people that were evacuating because they were moving massively up the stairs while people were trying to come down. So it slowed dramatically the egress of people. So yes, all these issues have to be considered. But in principle, we only need one. Okay, if we want to get people out, one will be enough. It has to be designed appropriately, it has to be protected appropriately, everything. And then if I have a complex building, 
I might put a second one just purely for the sake of redundancy. You know, so if the building is not very tall and it's not very complex, one will be probably enough. And if, as the building starts becoming more complex, then maybe for redundancy I want to put two. I would never want to go and go for three. It doesn't make any sense. Now obviously, if the floor plan is enormous and the distances for people to get to the stairs are extremely long, then I will, yes, have to put other, st other means of egress, no? Because then people will still be in the floor when the fire has become significant enough that it starts to make them misbehave. Is that okay? So here are the concepts. So we talked about yesterday about the egress time has to be much smaller than the fire time. This basically takes away the feeling of threat. Okay? So you're way away from the threat. Yes? And so um, being away from the threat, then you're able to kind of control your behavior or you're able to have more confidence that the human behavior is going to be as close to the... Yes, to, to the Lagrangian model. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. So effectively, that's what we're aiming at. So this number has to be much bigger than this one. This one is a reference number that I'm going to use modeling it as Lagrangian particles. Okay? And effectively, if I can guarantee that there's a big difference between these two, that basically means I have a very high probability that people will behave as a Lagrangian particles. That's the objective. Okay? So this is what we normally call the R set versus the A set analysis. This is a required safe egress time, which is the time that it takes to people out, what is required to get everybody safely. And this is the available safe egress time, which is the time to reach conditions of untenability. Is that okay? So that's the fire safety strategy. And if we use the codes, we assume that that is implicit. So we're going to create a code compliant design, and that, is, that goal is achieved implicitly. Okay. So it's by definition. Now, if you want to do a performance-based design, uh, this is a very well-known, one of the first performance-based designs uh, ever done in, in, in the world. So this is the Georges Pompidou in Paris. And, uh, and there you actually have to demonstrate it. So you have to do the calculation. So I have to be able to calculate my R set, and I have to be able to calculate my A set. OK? So let's start with the A set the available safe egress time. So let me turn on the lights and I'm going to use the board. Lights. OK. I want to calculate my available safe egress time. In other words, it's the time that is necessary for the fire to bring me to conditions that are untenable. Okay? You all have a little bit of background in combustion, so you should be able to tell me where do I start. So time equals zero. Okay? Yes. Probability of one. So when it comes to the available safe egress time, I don't care how long does it take me to ignite, because my problem time equals zero starts the moment it ignited. OK, what happens next? Yes, but what do I do? Hmm? No, no, that's a protection. OK, so we'll implement the protection systems, OK? But I'm talking about calculating the available safe figures time. In other words, I have to calculate the evolution of the fire. From growth. Yes. The fire grows according to some law that presumably has been worked out by now. Well, I kind of want to know. So here you have, this is the room, OK? And I want to calculate how fast will the fire grow in this room. Yeah. So you have to take into account the fuel. Is that OK? Which one? Why? 
Hmm? Which one? Pick one. Tell me which one is the more flammable. Theirs. Why? Textile. And why is textile a problem? Textile on fire. How do you know? Sorry. <laughs> 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 why not the backpack, which is also textile? Why not an electrical fault? You know, this, you have a lot of plastics crammed in this cubicle. Why the fact that it ignites faster is the problem that you're trying to address? Hmm? No, because it already ignited. So what is, so where do I start? Yeah, but tell me how. What data? You're in this room. Tell me, where do I put the fire? Yeah? Everywhere. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm assuming that. So, 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 so you're a gambler. So you actually want to go through the Monte Carlo simulation. OK? In other words, we'll try everything. Yeah? Tell me, which one is the first one I'm going to try? And then I'll try every other possible one. Where do, I, where do I start? I mean, if you have a car, and you want to take the car engine, and you want to tell me how much energy is being released in the car engine, do you know where to start? Fuel that it's consuming. Exactly. So you know how much air you're putting in there. You have the stoichiometry. You burn the whole damn thing. And you say, fine, this is the maximum energy I can produce. Is that OK? Yep. Maybe some efficiency. You lower it down, and we're done. That's what C.F. Taylor has in his book. Exactly. So you know how to design a car, but you cannot tell me where I start the fire. Put it in the middle of the room. Why? Because that averages out the location. It's the most representative. It's the mean position. But is it the worst case scenario? No, I think the wall would start. be the worst case scenario. Not necessarily the worst. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the wall probably has some of the no, no, but, but I mean, you know, this is a very good argument. So you're basically saying, I'm going to start with the mean, and then I start moving around. Yep. OK? Um, yeah. Near the door, yeah, that would block the potential. Yes, but you see, you made a choice based on the people. OK, what I want to know is first I need to calculate my A set. OK? So that then I can compare it to the people. OK? So I'm really only focusing on the combustion process. Okay, well, then, if you want to get that, you build the fire by the door, because that's going to most quickly block when people can escape. But they have another door. <laughs> <laughs> Redundancy. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I dare call myself a fire engineer, I will put precautions so that the smoke doesn't go through the ducts. No, no, I'm saying because uh, if air is flowing in, so it will uh, continue giving the fire fresh oxygen to continue spreading. Is that necessary? No, no, no. Let's, let's touch that. I mean, this is, this is a very important point that you're making. So if I take a match, OK, and I ignite the match, what happens if I blow hard? So is it a problem to give oxygen to a fire? <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't waffle me. You know, tell me, is it a problem to throw air to a fire? Does that make it, make it stronger? Depends on the rate. Depends on the rate, right? Why? No, 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 no. Don't throw damn color, please. Yes. Let's go to the basics. OK? You're, you're cooling the fire. If you cool it, you cool it more than it can produce. I can blow it off. Yes. That's a possibility. OK? So it's not necessarily a bad thing to blow air on the fire. Yes. OK? Now, the problem is when you're saying that if I put oxygen that lands in the fire, what is what you're afraid of? But why? Why there is a relationship between the air and the flame spread? 
because you think that by putting more air in the fire, there's going to be more combustion. Okay? What if the combustion is extremely lean? How lean do you think a fire is? What is the stoichiometry that we're talking about? The fact that we normally see soot and smoke means that it must be fuel rich. I don't agree. Okay. Okay? Because there's other ways by which you can get inefficiency of combustion. Okay. And in this case, the problem is that if you have a fire and you're producing the fuel in here and you get the oxidizer coming in here, the problem is that they don't reach each other effectively enough. That doesn't mean that you have a deficit of this. Mm -hmm. There is no concept such an equivalent ratio when you're talking about a diffusion flame. Yeah. Is that okay? So effectively, this, uh, the two of them are not next to each other, and it is the transport that creates this sort of inefficiency of the combustion process that effectively leads into incomplete combustion. Okay, and that's why flames are yellow. Okay, soot gets produced, gets oxidized, and then you get the bright yellow flame, but it is not because you have a deficit of oxygen. Okay? Yeah. Hold on, we, no, we've deflected from the question. Yeah, I'll, I'll get back to the question. So yeah. The Why? You might do that. You might identify where all the ignition sources are, and then those, those will be your starting points, okay? But somebody might actually move the tables into one corner, and then all of a sudden everything can change. You, I wouldn't put it in the ceiling, because the problem is that if you look at what will happen in the ceiling, buoyancy is going in this direction. So your heat exchange and everything is going to be incredibly inefficient if you have a ceiling fire as opposed to what you might have if you have a, a floor fire, where you can have a much better sort of axis of oxidizer and fuel to each other, okay? So the fluid mechanics dominates the problem, and you might not decide that the ceiling is the most efficient form of diffusion flame in this particular case. But let's go back to the question. You see, I need to understand what the available safe egress time is, and for that, I need to be able to model how the fire is going to grow. But before I can model how the fire is going to grow, I need to resolve a fundamental problem, is what is the fire I'm going to model? It's not a car engine when I know how much fuel I have and how much oxygen I'm putting in there, and then I can run my super complex DNS model and effectively get the problem solved. Here I have to make a fundamental decision that is driven by uncertainty. Okay, and knowing where to start is where the problem starts. Okay, and you have to have a very deep understanding of the problem before you actually make those choices. Because you might end up either with misconceptions, misunderstandings, or simply modeling a fire that is not the fire that you should be modeling. So let's make a decision, okay? And let's make a decision that is arbitrary, okay? We'll get back and try to put logic to my decision, but let's make it completely arbitrary, okay? He's gonna burn first, okay? So I'm gonna ignite the chair that is there, okay? How do I model the fire then? Here's your chair. Okay, so you need to know the materials. So you're going to have a fabric, you're gonna have a foam. Do you have anything else in this particular chair? No, they're made of Oh, there's a lot of plastic, actually. You have plastic. Okay, so where do I start? Which of the three I'm going to ignite? Hmm? How do you know which one is the easiest to ignite? Uh, 
What temperature? What is an ignition temperature? You have a plastic, it's a solid. What is the ignition temperature of a solid? Okay, so you've taken one step back. Now you're talking about pyrolysis. I thought we were talking about ignition. So what do you have to do first? Okay, so before you ignite, you have to undergo another process, which is pyrolysis. Do we agree? So there's degradation chemistry that is going to happen ahead of time. How do I know which one has the most effective degradation chemistry? I have a foam, I have a fabric, I have a plastic. Plastic is most likely polyethylene, the foam is most likely polyurethane, the fabric is most likely a cellulosic material. Okay? Where is the degradation chemistry? So I need that, no? Because I cannot ignite if I don't paralyze. Why do I need to paralyze to ignite? Because effectively a flame is in the gas phase. So I need to produce gas fuel. So before I even look into how these things are burning, I have to start talking about pyrolysis. Is that okay? Are we comfortable with that? I have a question. You, you just said the T0 starts from the ignition. Yes. In order to calculate, in order to have fire, we need to have pyrolysis. But for the acid number, do we really need to study pyrolysis? No, no, I don't need to study the ignition, but I still need to study the pyrolysis. Because once it ignites, it has to gasify. Is that okay? So the rate at which fuel is going to be produced, the rate at which the flame is going to spread, is going to depend on pyrolysis. Keep in mind that what is flame spread? If I ignite where I am standing, and I want to ignite the next part of the carpet, what do I need to do? I have to heat it, pyrolyze it, and ignite it, and then it spreads. So fire growth is actually a sequence of ignitions. So I don't care when it ignited, I actually do care about ignition because flame spread is a sequence of ignitions. Is that okay? So if I'm going to make the decision of which one I'm going to ignite, okay, do I care which one ignites faster? It's not the ignition that matters, but it's the sequence of ignitions that matters. Is that okay? Because that's what determines the growth of the fire. So the process of ignition is important, but what I'm really interested in is how that process progresses. So of all these three materials, which one is the one I'm gonna pick? Yes. Why the slowest? So that will give me the fastest or the slowest spread? Well, let's not touch on the word realistic yet, okay? Let's stick to either fastest or slowest, and then we'll move somewhere in between into realism. I would say the foam, because it has the highest surface to volume ratio, okay. therefore able to gas off more readily. Okay, so surface to volume ratio, what does that do? Effectively, if I put heat through the surface and I have a very small volume, then this material is gonna reach a high temperature very rapidly. So effectively, surface to volume ratio is very important. The bigger your surface to volume ratio, the faster your heat exchange. Is that okay? So. Yep. So the foam is basically a porous media that every fiber has a very high surface to volume ratio. What about the fabric? It's the same, no? With the added advantage that it's also thermally thin. Okay? What about the plastic? 
burn the raw material, but it's too bulky. It's too hard to heat. So the surface to volume ratio is actually quite smaller. Yep. Is that okay? So probably is less prone to heat. Is that okay? So all these things start playing a role, no? In what I'm gonna choose. Now, are they going to interact with each other once I ignite one of them? And how is that interaction going to happen? And how do you know which one is doing what? It depends on the pyrolysis, no? So you go back to the pyrolysis kinetics. If you have a material that very readily degrades, it is most likely the first one who is gonna be gasifying. And that's the one who is gonna be feeding the flame. And once you get the flame, the flame is gonna burn the others. But it could be dominated by the one that is chemically more reactive. And what about if the one that is chemically more reactive is actually the one that is the thickest? It's pretty complicated, no? So it starts getting very, very complicated to the point that it becomes intractable. Okay, and I haven't moved beyond pyrolysis. So should we be modeling this? No, we could just look at your and see which one burns. Well, that would be the other extreme, no? So you could just get a chair and burn it. Is that okay? And then try to create some scenario that is representative. Do I need more than that? Do I need to be more precise than that? That's the point, no? So what's the purpose of all this? To compare the A set to the R set. Is that okay? So the question is, to what extent do I need that precision? Okay? And how do I gauge to what extent it is important for me to be able to model this at a sufficient level of precision? Yes? Well, let me put it this way. If the codes were built correctly, that means somebody should have done that work ahead of time, no? Because keep in mind that the concept behind a code is that you classify a building, and if that building falls within the classification, then you have a solution that you have certainty that it will work. And once you have a solution that you have certainty that it works, you frame it under the structure of a recipe, and that's the code. The performance assessment okay, is a required component of the development of codes. Okay? So if you cannot determine performance correctly, then you cannot turn it into a code. Okay? So the fact that you as an engineer are only, is only required to follow the recipe doesn't mean that somebody else didn't do the work. Okay? Now, that's not always the case. Unfortunately, codes are also a matter of interests. So different organizations try very hard to embed things into the codes. Why? Because it becomes a means to access the market. So if it's compliant, then people can buy it and can put it in there. So I can use the code process to embed things that have not been tested. And that happens all the time. So the codes become a little bit of a fussy space, but theoretically, a code, it is just a pre-assessed solution that we know with certainty that it works. Is that okay? So, effectively, the key to all this is to really understand to what extent I need to solve this in a precise way. Because the problem is that you are operating in an environment that it is not a managed environment. And therefore, the conditions that you're going to have in here and the systems that are part of the problem are so complex in nature that you can spend your life trying to model how a chair burns. You know, I don't have to even go that far. I can just try to explain to you how a candle burns. 
Okay, and I can spend two hours just talking about how the wick was designed. Do you have a clue how a wick is designed? Have you heard of the smoke point? You know what the smoke point is? It's the moment where you produce so much fuel that effectively a flame that actually is closed, okay, because you're producing the fuel here, okay, the oxygen is coming from the outside, okay, and the strain rate at this point is sufficiently low that your critical damp color number is not attained. So effectively you get combustion in the integrity of the flame, and what ends up happening is that all the fuel gets consumed. What everything that comes out in this direction is complete products of combustion. Is that okay? If I put too much fuel, okay, the fuel is so distant that the flow, the unit mass flow of fuel to the flame starts decreasing as I'm moving away. So this flame becomes bigger. And as the flame becomes bigger, I'm increasing the level of strain to the point I reach the critical damp color number and the flame quenches. It cannot close, so it becomes an open tip. Is that okay? So you've reached a level of strain that here you are with a damp color number great, smaller than the critical damp color number and the flame has quenched. The moment that is quenched, it becomes a passage for incomplete products of combustion, particularly soot, that actually gets through. That's what we call the smoke point. Is that okay? Now, if you have a candle in your home, and your candle is producing so much fuel that it goes beyond the smoke point, how is your ceiling going to look? Black, okay? So the Victorians, Actually, it was Faraday, you know, who explained it, but the Victorians had already figured this out, okay? They recognized that if this is the wick, what happens? Surface to volume ratio. The longer I make the wick, the more surface I have, the bigger the mass of fuel that is produced. So if the wick is too long, then what happens? You get a lot of fuel. You exceed the critical damp color number, you quench the flame, you exceed the smoke point, and your ceiling is black. Is that okay? So how do I prevent the wick from getting too big as it's consuming the wax? Regress. Huh? Regress. Well, you have to make it regress, but it won't because the wick you know, because of capillarity is being filled with molten wax. So the temperature is much, much lower than the pyrolysis temperature of the fabric, of the cellulosic. So while the wick is imbibed with wax, it will never regress. It will just keep growing. If you have to trim it back periodically. So that's what people did in the 17th century. They will come in and clip it. So they had these very fancy silver clips that you know had all these ornaments and all the stuff. You know, you, you can buy them on auction. You know, if you have you ever seen Antiques Roadshow? You know, you can get them for thousands of dollars, these wick trimmers. But the Victorians were much smarter than that. They discovered differential thermal expansion. In other words, they weaved the wick in a way such that there was not one fabric, but there were actually two fabrics. One, most of the wick, and then a second one that was only on one side of the wick. The smaller, this one on the one side, expands less than the one forming most of the wick. So the wick, as it warmed up, it bends. And the moment it bends, it touches the flame. It exceeds the pyrolysis temperature, and what does it do? It trims itself automatically. I'm sorry, pure genius. I mean, seriously. Okay, this is 18th century ingenuity. Okay, so problem solved. Go to your house, 
ignite a wick, and you will see the first thing it does is whoop, and it burns itself naturally. Fixes the length. The flame never exceeds the critical damp color number. You know, and all that was done before damp color was even born. Pure genius, huh? So this is how complicated it can be, but actually how fantastic it can be if you do it right. So you see, it can get really complicated. So the question is, how do we assess the level of complexity? So let me go back and show you a video so you can give me a sense of the level of complexity. So this is a fire that we try to make simple. And the way we try to make simple, we try to eliminate all the uncertainties of the earlier stages of the fire. So we said, let's just make it big enough so that there's so much energy already being produced that the fate of the fire has already been sealed. Is that okay? If you ignite with a kernel, it might die out, you know, it might grow very slowly, it might creep through the back of the sofa, but if you actually pour half a gallon of petrol, you know, you know you're gonna get a big fire. Is that okay? So that's what happened. So there's the ignition source, and there's the petrol. Okay? There's the sofa, and there you have a fire. There's a typical furniture that you will have in a, in a room. Then as the fire starts growing, then somehow the conditions change, and it starts becoming less efficient. You start getting black smoke. Eventually, everything is going to ignite. And once everything ignites, that's what we call flashover. You have plenty, now you have too much fuel. So this is when now, if you blow air into that, you will make the fire stronger. So eventually the fire is gonna heat up the glass. The glass is gonna break. And the moment it breaks, because you have excess fuel inside the compartment, the fuel starts burning on the outside of the compartment. And what you get is uh, flames on the outside of the compartment. So you saw the glass breaking, and then all the excess fuel starts coming out, and you can see how the flames start burning on the outside of the compartment, okay? So you've gone to a condition where the stoichiometry inside the compartment is so rich that most of the flames are burning out and they're not burning in. That's what we call a post flashover fire, okay? So people can go and say, well, we can model this. So this is the fire dynamic simulator, which is the most commonly used software in fire. And here you have a prescribed fire. So I'm putting a fire in here in the middle. Okay, and I'm going to introduce the fuel in a prescribed way, and I'm going to basically model the combustion using large eddy simulation. Okay? So there it goes. It starts burning. It produces smoke. The smoke is supposed to start filling up in the top, but I actually am putting a vent. This is to test a smoke extraction system. And effectively, I'm going to allow the smoke to accumulate in the top of the building, as you can see here. But the purpose of this simulation was to prevent the smoke from descending because the door of the stairs went, it was inside, so people had to exit through the lobby. Because this is a tall building, and I don't have I have an enormous amount of time to get everybody out. I cannot afford the smoke ever descending to the bottom. So what I'm going to be doing is extracting smoke at the top so that the smoke layer establishes in here in such a way that the smoke will never reach the ground, okay? In other words, I gave infinite time for people to evacuate. Is that okay? So my Tenability or TF is much, much, much greater than my TE. 
okay? It's an extreme condition because I've guaranteed that the smoke layer will never descend. In other words, I put a big fan in here and I'm extracting as much smoke as I can to make sure that the line never stops. Now, there are several problems with this. The first one is I made the decision of what the fire is going to be. Because if I'm going to be modeling this using large eddy simulation, and I'm going to have a system of this magnitude, the level of resolution that I have for the burning area is such that I cannot model the pyrolysis. Okay? I don't have the capacity to resolve the heat transfer to a sufficient level of detail to be able to model the pyrolysis, and therefore I have to prescribe the fire, which requires a whole set of decisions that I have to make on what the fire is going to be. Nevertheless, given the purpose of what I'm doing, I might be able, with a very simple definition of the fire, you know, be able to actually create a scenario that credibly allowed me to say that my A set was much smaller than my R set. Is that okay? Sorry, uh, the opposite. My R set much smaller than my A set. Is that clear? So that's the way we do it. Now, the range of complexity can go from the super complex to the super simple. Okay? So how do you think the codes define A set? Because you have to be quite careful, no? Because now we're talking about a predefined solution, no? So what's the definition of the A set according to our building codes? How do you think they did it? You know, because we were talking you know, that it's a proven solution. So we have to have a mechanism to prove that that solution works. Is that okay? What is the mechanism that our building codes around the world use to demonstrate that it works? How can I generalize a fire to the point that I can do what I just did with a large eddy simulation code and I can do it in a manner such that it applies to every building that falls within the classification? Let's say my classification is a theater. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that once something else is ignited, by the radio heat oh, of course. So in this particular case, I was very lucky because, you know, the lobby is free of fuel with the exception of the desk. So I could model a single burning item and say only a desk is going to burn and the maximum fire size that I can have is when the desk is fully involved. Okay? So that was pretty straightforward in here. Now, the reality is that in, in a theater, in a, in a room like this, the problem is much more complex than that, no? And of course, have to take into account radiation and all this physics. Yeah, until one additional thing is ignited, nothing has happened. Uh, well, it depends how big the initial thing is. So if you have a very large sofa, okay. then the sofa can burn to the point that it can bring you to untenable conditions, like I had in my video. Okay? Yeah. So that's a slightly more sophisticated way of doing it, no? That you can actually standardize the contents of a, of a room and basically say, this is one thing that I'm going to have normally, and as a function of that, I create a standardized file. Okay? That's the way. Oh, there you go. So let me show you a past example then. Okay? So there it is. So this is the uh, Empire Theater in, in Edinburgh, and uh, it was a congregation space, a theater, and, uh, and there was a successful evacuation, that's your past example, and, uh, and it burned in 1911, and effectively burned the whole place down, and uh, there was 3,000 people in the audience, and they all managed to evacuate in two and a half minutes, and nobody died, okay? The people that died were all behind backstage, nobody died in the hall. So it was considered a successful evacuation. Is that okay? 
and people could actually establish that it was two and a half minutes. Okay? So basically, this ended up informing the building regulations that effectively were formalized completely all the way up to 1952, and from them there they spread all around the world. Okay? So that was an example. Okay? Now the story is, is, is an interesting one. Uh, the story involves uh, the great Lafayette, you know, which is a magician, and uh, the story tells that the great Lafayette had a double. So when he would perform his magic tricks, he had this other great Lafayette that will appear and disappear with him. And, as, and apparently the fame has, had got to him, and he decided that he wanted to disappear forever. And the way he decided to disappear forever was to kill his double. So he set the stage on fire, you know, with the intention of killing the double, but they both died. Okay, I think the dog also died, unf unfortunately. But, uh, uh, but the problem is that what ended up happening at the time, you know, these performances had an orchestra. Okay? And the orchestra uh, was sitting there, they saw the fire, and the director of the orchestra, in all his wisdom, decided that he was going to play the God Save the King. Okay? So they stood up, they started playing the God Save the King, that forced everybody to stand up, and that expedited the egress of the building. And they knew it was two and a half minutes because the God Save the King lasts for two and a half minutes. So they finished playing the song, everybody was out, and they recognized that if you can get everybody in two and a half minutes, that basically means here, there you have the example that you were talking about. Is that okay? So effectively, that's, that's the example, and, uh, and that's how the available safe egress time became, in the 1920s, two and a half minutes. The fire was too difficult to model, we had no idea how to deal with it. They didn't have the tools to deal with it. Nevertheless, they had a case study that proved that this was appropriate. So let me show you uh, a video. So effectively, what ends up happening is that after this, everything else starts building around it. Because now that you knew that your ACID was two and a half minutes, what do you have to do with the people? You have to get them out in less than two and a half minutes, no? So I start designing my corridors, I start designing my doors, I start designing everything in the building in such a way that people can get out in less than two and a half minutes, okay? So this is a classroom, okay, with students, very much the same setting that you have here. And it's me throwing the alarm. That's called the pre-movement time. So my R set is a bit smaller than two and a half minutes. No? So if I was to say 
that the Freedom Tower is designed against two and a half minutes, that the Burj Khalifa is designed against two and a half minutes, that stadia are designed against two and a half minutes, that nuclear power plants are designed against two and a half minutes. What will you tell me? I can go through every single building code and every dimension of a stair, every dimension of a corridor, every dimension of a door, every single component is designed against two and a half minutes. No, 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 the fire is two and a half minutes. There's no, no type of fire. They all burn in two and a half minutes. No matter what room you are, no matter what building you are, the ASET is two and a half minutes. Yes? And this is all over the world? All over the world. We did an exercise where we actually showed regulations from Hong Kong, from Australia, from the UK, from the US, from France, from Spain. Every building, every dimension is designed against two and a half minutes. You can go home now. <laughs> no need for combustion anymore. You see, this is the problem that we're facing. No? So it's a fundamental issue of misunderstanding the complexity of the problem. Now, in, in the case of the Empire Theater, two and a half minutes was completely overdimensioned. Why? Because the ceilings were so high that by the time the smoke descended, you know, by the time the radiation was significant, by the time the flame spread was important, you probably had 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So designing against two and a half minutes is a very significant overdimensioning of the problem, okay? Well, the reality is that in other cases, if you have a very low ceiling, you know, where you have, for example, bookshelves, you might actually be underdimensioning the problem. Nevertheless, we are designing against the same. So today, unfortunately, you will never find two and a half minutes in any code. It's so embedded into the dimensioning of the building, okay, that effectively you never even know, okay? So the maximum egress distances are defined as a function of that asset. Now, an architect, when an architect designs a tall building, basically what they say is, okay, it's very straightforward. I put a stair here, okay? And they go and put in the middle, and then they say, okay, a circle. This is the maximum egress distance based on two and a half minutes, okay? Then what they do is they put the other stair, which is a redundancy, Okay? The code says that they have to be separated a certain distance to basically guarantee that they behave as two independent stairs. If you put them too close, then effectively they act as one, so there's no redundancy. Okay? So basically you put it here, this distance is defined by the code, and then what do they do? They put a circle in here. There you go. So effectively, the floor plan of your building cannot exceed this. So every building in the world, the floor plan is designed in such a way that it never exceeds that space. Every building, every tall building. Okay, so on that note, let's break for about 10 minutes, let you reflect a little bit and then I'll go into even further absurdity. <laughs>